Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Witkoff, Greenberg Traurig. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, MHP Real Estate Services, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? University of Richmond? Lord and Taylor? Macy's? Nah, urban planning. I don't know. EDC? Masters in urban planning? CBS? Guardian Life? Silver Cup Studios? Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the guy who is the head of Toll Brother City leaving for New York City, David Von Spreckelson. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So tell me about the grandparents, where they came from. Well, on my father's side, my grandparents came from uh, Germany, outside of uh, Hamburg. Uh, and they uh, came to the United States in uh, the uh, teens, 20s. Um, and they, they came to Brooklyn, right? They came to well, separately. They met in, met in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, they they married and they opened a bakery uh, in Bay Ridge on, in, in the Bay, Bay Ridge, Ridge section. On Bay Ridge on uh, Fifth Avenue. Yeah. So that was uh, that's your father's. That's side. my father's side. Okay, and then the Wimples. The Wimples, my mother's side, uh, were from North Dakota. So my mother was uh, born in a very rural, basically a farm in now, North Dakota. Now, where did they come from? The that side of the family. They were both born in North Dakota, but the, my, my mother's, mother's side was uh, from, uh, from Norway, and my mother's father's side were from uh, Ireland. So talk to me about um, your, your father growing up in Brooklyn. He grew up in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn? Yeah, he, he was born and raised in, in Bay Ridge. Uh, he went to Brooklyn Tech. Um, and then after Brooklyn Tech, he went to Cooper Union. Now, he went to Cooper Union. One of the great benefits until recently, Cooper Union was uh, totally free yeah. uh, for, for good people who, went, who had good academic. But you said your father really didn't want to be a civil engineer. Yeah, he was really into writing, more the creative side. And so he got his degree in civil engineering because there weren't many choices what to major in there. It's essentially architecture, engineering, art, and um, got out and worked for a very brief time up uh, upstate New York for some civil engineering firm, but didn't like it. And um, while he was there, started trying to write for articles for technical magazines. And then he did that for um, a few years. 
and was eventually hired by um, Burson Marsteller. Now, Burson Marsteller was based in Chicago. Based in Chicago. And That's Burson, where they were starting. Right, yeah. So he moves out to Chicago. So he moves to Wait, Chicago. When does he move to Chicago? In that's about 50, no, that's, in the, that's like 57 or so. Yeah, so he's there in 57, and Mr. Marsteller, I believe, right? Yeah. We have a copy of a letter <laughs> that Mr. Marsteller had an assistant that he really didn't want to lose. He, he really felt very important about her. She was uh, his apple of the eye, we would say, right? Yes, that's... And, and this was your mother. Right. And you, how did your father meet your mother at Burson Marsteller? Yeah, so my father worked uh, directly for Harold Burson. He was the, one of the few account guys. It was a small firm at the time. And my mother was William Marsteller's secretary. And uh, they met at work, fell in love, and my father proposed to her. And then, you know, it was almost as if William Marsteller gave her, gave her away. You know, he wrote that letter. Um, interesting letter, <laughs> but he cared about it. Yeah, he did. Um, and then, so they got engaged in Chicago. And then, um, uh, at that time, my, my father was, uh, one of his big accounts was, uh, Bethlehem Steel and they offered him a job. Here's this woman who grew up in North Dakota, who now is in Chicago. And all of a sudden she's going to end up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. You know, it's funny you hit on that because we, you know, I've never talked to you about that. And, and uh, my mother was unhappy early on in Bethlehem. She wasn't working. My father was working. She wasn't working. You know, get, they were getting ready to have a family, but she was quite bored. Um, but then eventually she met a lot of people, made right, friends. Because it was provincial. Very okay, provincial. You know, yeah. Especially when you have the hustle and bustle of Chicago and you, you leave the environment of, of the Dakotas, you know, it's, it's a different thing. Yeah. She so, loved Chicago. Yeah. So when did they move to uh, Bethlehem? So that was 59, and they, they basically moved there, got married that week, and then bought, uh, bought a house in, uh, on the west side of uh, Bethlehem, where I was born. You have an older sister? An older sister and a younger sister. So you, you, were, you like sports growing up, right? That's what I, you know, right. we have some pictures of you yeah. playing baseball. Yeah. Uh, soccer? Soccer. Um, re- actually, my favorite sport was basketball, but I eventually didn't grow enough to, uh, to keep playing that. So Now, what you did say to me is that your, grand, your, grand, your grandfather, your, your paternal grandfather passed on. Right? Yeah, when my father was only about 12 years old. And, and your grandmother married another baker. Yes. Who happened to work, for, uh, was the chef for General Patton? Yeah, when he was in, uh, in World War II, he was Patton's uh, essentially pastry chef. And he used to tell stories. Uh, he loved Patton. And he said Patton always would say, whatever I eat, that's what the men eat. He always made sure that he didn't get any special treatment. So... What was interesting is that you, growing up in Bethlehem, you'd make frequent trips to New York, right? You said the... Yep, to Bay Ridge. To Bay Ridge, yeah. okay, go to the... And then once in a while, you had that opportunity to go to Madison Square Garden to see your favorite team, the Knicks, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that's... We used to come up uh, for the holidays, and the Knicks used to always play Christmas Day, and we'd get on the subway in Bay Ridge, and we'd take it to... Uh, to Madison Square Garden, see all the bombs. See, that's why you have station. roots in Brooklyn. I mean, yeah. you truly have roots in Brooklyn. No, that's, yeah. And that's why you live in Brooklyn now. Yes. Now, so you're, you're in high school, and then you said to me that you decided that you wanted to find this, a place which is as far away as possible from Bethlehem. Well, I would say that when I, when I applied to schools, I wanted to go to a small liberal arts school. I didn't really know what I wanted to major in, what I wanted to be in life, but... I applied mostly to schools that were pretty close to Bethlehem. And then when it came time to actually, when I got the acceptances and I had the choice, I picked University of Richmond because it was the farthest away of and, the schools and, that I had and, applied to. And a to. good liberal school. And a good school that's just gotten better and better. And now I could never get in, but I got in back then. So. So, so you go to University of Richmond. And what's your ideas at that time? You said to me you were a voracious reader and you liked economics. Yeah, I like to read, and I was taking the, all the liberal arts courses, philosophy, psychology, all of those, and, but then it was really economics that really when I was studying that, it really explained the way the world worked, um, from business to politics to everything else, and I thought that that was something that was an interesting 
uh, major and something that had a, a good mix of um, theory as well as quantitative work. And so it just, it just fit really well, and I, I liked it, and I majored in it. So you graduate Richmond at what year? In 1985. So it's 1985. It's not the recession yet, but it was pretty close to the recession of 87 uh, and the stock market crash of 87. Yeah. And how do you end up with a job uh, as an assistant buyer in the executive training program at Lord & Taylor, which at that time was owned by the May Company? Right. That was, um, that was an on-campus interview in, when I was in Richmond. And I, again, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I was thinking I'd probably get a master's and get an MBA, but I wanted to have a couple years of work experience. And um, I did some interviewing, and that was the job that I got that was in New York City. And, I, and, and that's where I wanted to And you to were living with Grandma? I moved, well, she had passed away by then, so I moved into Bay Ridge with my grandfather, Alphonse Baumeister, the patent pastry chef, and my uncle. Um, and I uh, commuted, you know, each day from Bay Ridge to, to Lord & Taylor. On 38th right Street, Street over here? Yeah. So you're over there, and then what happens? So how come you decided to go to Macy's later on? So I was in this executive development program where you're an assistant buyer. I happen to be in girls 7 to 14. Um, and I was at the next stage where you're supposed to go out and become a department manager in one of the stores in the hinterlands. And the o only openings were in somewhere like Texas and Florida. And I, was, I really loved New York, and I was trying to save money to go to business school living with you know my grandparents so I looked for other retail programs where I could take that next step and the one that was available in New York City was Macy's on Tilden Avenue Flatbush and Tilden which is the, is the smallest Macy's in the history of the store um, and because it was so small I ended up with a bunch of departments I had you had ladies you were in the I had ladies apparel yeah I had Macy woman which is large sizes for women I had juniors, and I had coats and swimwear. So it was almost uh, about a quarter of the store. Very appropriate for urban planning <laughs> uh, and a master's. Well, it was an interesting place to work, um, to really see a part of the city that I hadn't really seen before. Right, you were Bay Ridge. I was at, in Bay Ridge. And now you were going to a different neighborhood near the Lois Kings, which had closed by that time. Had probably. closed. Erasmus is there. Right. And the, very, very heavy West Indian population. Well, there was the mix of... So it was interesting, the dynamic in the store, the older ladies, sales ladies, were all Jewish, and the younger ones were all West Indian, and that's how the neighborhood was changing. So what happens next? You're, you finish that. So while, I, while I'm there, I'm applying to business school, and I get accepted to Columbia Business School, and I, and I uh, go to Columbia, and I'm early on commuting from Bay Ridge to, to 116th Street, which would take like over an hour. I remember one time I had a... Uh, an exam and the subway was not running. I had to get on a bus and a transfer and I got there late and it was stressful. But yeah, I was a commuter essentially. So, and you did this full time? Full time, yeah. yeah. So after that, then because of your retail expertise from, right. uh, you know, from Lord and & Taylor and from Macy's, you get a job as a retail consultant for Coopers & Library. Yeah, it was a which was kind of a quintessential job for MBA students. They, a lot of them from uh, Columbia obviously went to Wall Street, but a lot of MBA people wanted to be a management consultant. I never really wanted to be that, but that, it was a tough economy. It was 89. You were talking about the crash in 87. I was at Columbia when that happened, and people were about jumping out of windows. Um, but uh, that, was the, that was the job I got and uh, because of my so, retail experience. So it was retail consulting for Coopers & Libraries. So how long were you with? Uh, Very short time. And I, I moved on, I left without uh, having another job. And then I ended up um, moving back home to Bethlehem for a couple of years to try to figure out exactly what, what I wanted to do. What were you doing in Bethlehem now? Well, I was... I um, mean, you have an MBA, you have a retail background. Yeah. Bethlehem is not the, the, me the mecca for retail stores. No, it wasn't. And I was, I, I didn't really, I didn't want to stay in retail. Um, when I was at Columbia... I was most enamored of marketing and advertising, and I would try to get a job in that. Didn't work out. Ended up in management consulting. Didn't like it. Left. Went home. And um, I was, uh, while thinking about what I wanted to do, starting to consider different programs for maybe another graduate degree um, or to tr you know, try to get something more marketing, advertising-related, 
I took at part-time jobs adjunct uh, professorships, and I did that at a community college and also Kutztown State University. So I taught marketing, and while I was there, I was thinking, you know, I really like this lifestyle of, uh, you know, you teach a couple classes, you have a lot of time off, you have the summers off. And so I started to consider um, PhD programs, and I applied and got into some. And then I just I was a little worried that I I wasn't so into one subject where I would spend the rest of my life thinking about it, writing about it, because you got to publish and everything. So at about that time, I was uh, hanging out with some friends, and one of them was uh, uh, in the urban planning program at Rutgers. And it sounded really interesting what he was doing. And I was thinking to myself, you know, the one thing that I know I love is New York City. I just love cities. So why don't I look into that? And so I looked into the programs in New York, and um, Hunter offered me a full fellowship to go there so I could go there for free. And I came so back. Now, the full fellowship is, did you have to do, do, do some teaching? I did, uh, I did teacher's assistant stuff, but I was even paid for that. So I had a little bit of an income. Back to Bay Ridge? No. Th by then, I had moved in with my girlfriend, who later became my wife. And we were in Brooklyn Heights. So I was living in Brooklyn Heights and you know, commuting to 68th Street. And um, I, uh, it was not the most rigorous program, so I had time to also do a bunch of internships. And I worked pretty much full time um, at a number of different ag city agencies. And then uh, the one that I worked at for the longest was the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which was the, the highest paying public sector. And what do you job. do with the Port Authority? Ferries? Ferries, exactly. The private ferry programs. Yeah. Uh, they were trying to get... Uh, because yeah, it's too expensive to build new tunnels and, and all this. So the, th the theory was, you know, we could get a lot trams, of people. trams, you know? Trams, you know, we didn't look into that. There is a guy in Brooklyn who's always talking about doing it, though. I heard the other day I was doing a show in Brooklyn. They were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I, was, so I was at the Port Authority, and I was graduating from uh, Hunter. With your urban planning. With the urban planning degree, and then I got a job at EDC. So what are you doing at EDC? This is Dinkins is there now? This is the very, very end of Dinkins. So under so Carl Weisbrot was the president. And um, the job that was open at the time was um, in the transportation department, which, you know, I had come from ferries. I had somewhat of an interest in that. So I, I took that. And um, the properties that I had were mostly maritime and mostly underutilized. So they one really. One of them was home port. One of them was a home port in Staten Island, and one was a passenger ship terminal in uh, Manhattan, and they became essentially development projects because they were so underutilized for transportation purposes. And so, at, uh, when my boss, uh, who was Chris Ward, uh, who later became the executive director of the Port Authority, um, when he left EDC, I took my projects over to the real estate development group at EDC. Um, and uh, and then stayed there for about three years, and then moved on after that. So now, urban planner, ferries, boats, other transportation issues, and developments. How do you end up? The next stop is CBS. No, I and went to Guardian Life. Guardian Life, where you're going to be in the equity and debt. Market. Exactly. Yeah. I got to the point where I didn't want to uh, continue at EDC and sort of be labeled a government person. I felt like I needed to get out of there. And I got a lot of great experience. And what I liked doing most there was working with developers. So I really wanted to be a developer, but it was 97 and it wasn't no, a great development time, market. Right. Yeah. Another not great time. So there were limited opportunities, but luckily enough, I found something at Guardian Life where I could um, uh, really hone my quantitative skills more. So I did equity and, and debt investments of, you know, pensioners' uh, money. So all of a sudden, so now you have the debt and equity over here. CBS? Yeah, CBS kind of came out of the blue. I was... Um, when I, when I worked at EDC, I mentioned the passenger ship terminal. So CBS was proposing to do film and television studios at the passenger ship terminal while I was there. They ended up not doing it, but I made some contacts there. And the guy who ran the real estate group for CBS uh, through a headhunter contacted me when I was at Guardian, said, would you be interested? And I said, of course. Because now, so now at CBS, 
part of it was leasing, right? Leasing, leasing, and more leasing, yeah. Most and, of it was leasing. And part of what you did, uh, you said to me when we got together, a number of things were at the GM building, right? Because oh, right, yeah. That was, a that, large... that, was, that was a fantastic opportunity. I was only at CBS for a little more than a year, but I ended up sort of with a development project. While it was mostly transactional leasing stuff, we had um, – CBS was doing its morning show back in a studio on 11th Avenue, and the other networks – had these shows outdoors with interviewing people and bands and all that. So uh, Mel Karmazin, who was running CBS at the time, uh, and uh, Donald Trump were somewhat friendly, and they were talking about you know what Mel wanted to do and have a show that was like out on a plaza. And Trump said, "Well, look, you know he owned the GM building, and um, uh, GM didn't need the showroom anymore for their right, cars. They, they were going to move out of there." And so they got together and said, okay, let's, let's do a show there and we can spill out onto the plaza. So there was a mandate to be on air by, I think it was November sweeps or whatever it was at the time. So while we were still doing the leasing, we were actually like moving in. And so it, it became kind of a leasing construction operations project. And it was very, it was very interesting. We took, um, we sublet space from FAO Schwartz, uh, from Estee Lauder. Uh, we had different parts in the building, and, and we got it on air on time, and it was, uh, it was, it was a really great experience. Um, I remember one of the funny things was uh, when I was, I, you know, I didn't work directly with Trump, but with his guys, and so when we were at the, the opening party, um, I was talking to him, and uh, Dan Rather was like walking around. He said, oh, Dan, come here. I said, have, have you met uh, David Von Spreckels? <laughs> I was like, you know, and... Uh, I, um, he says, oh, Dan Rather. And I said, you look familiar. But that was a, an interesting uh, moment. So, so now you're at CBS, and how do you get involved with, you, as you said, you wanted to be in development. The good thing that happened was you were doing this development with the studio. You had enough leasing, leasing, leasing right. 101. And how do you then get a job with Silver Cup Studios? So that was through the EDC Mafia. Um, I was coming out of the... Preface, EDC Mafia means former employees of the EDC. Who ended up in all these development jobs all across the city. So it's it's an unbelievable network of people. And um, I was coming out of the subway when I was living in Brooklyn Heights, and I ran into uh, Lisa Gomez, who was part of the EDC Mafia. And um, she said, I said, you know, I'm still looking to get into uh, development. And she said she knew of a couple of possibilities, and um, she told me about them. Oddly enough, but the, oddly enough, they were like two sides of the family, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, one was with this company who took over in 1976 or later on a bread factory, and they made it Silver Cup Studios, right? Uh, and also had some real estate holdings in the past through family and other things. And the other side of the family was the other part of Silver Cup Studios. Wife worked as the head of real estate for NYU Medical Center. Exactly, yeah. So how come you decided the, the studios versus the, the hospital? I spent some time making the decision, but in the end of the day, it was uh, that the, this, the Silver Cup job was really development. And the job with Vicky was... Uh, kind of much more like corporate real estate, like what I was doing at uh, CBS. And you wanted to be a little more entrepreneurial. I wanted to be entrepreneurial, but it was a big leap to go from uh, a company like CBS in the Black Rock building on 6th Avenue. And Long Island City? To Long Island City to work for two brothers and another guy. No place to eat lunch or anything. And um, I, I had to spend a little time thinking about it, but then I thought, you know what, this is really what I want to do. I'm just going to go for it. Now, what was really good and interesting at this period of time is that this is when the city was giving away land in certain neighborhoods, what we call the Anchor Program. Right. And you worked on one of the first projects on 116th Street when the Sunas uh, co-developed with Jeff Levine and Douglas and Development the, the retail and the residential yeah. affordable co op Limited, ac- limited, limited equity ac- co-ops, yeah. I got there when uh, it was all baked and, and they were moving along. And the part of it that I worked on initially was leasing of the retail space. It was, a, it was about, I think, 65,000 square feet of retail space. 
And um, I did that, and then I did the conveying of the units to the people who were buying the co-ops. Yeah, but what was interesting during that period of time was the retail space, that the community wanted retail space, and then they they decided that they, they made a determination. They felt that certain retailers were inappropriate, right? Yes. We'll call it in, the, in, the, in that manner. So now you're at Silver Cup for a couple of times, and then you, how did this, you know, this row, this major housing company out of Pennsylvania, find the kid who worked for EDC and Silver Cup and a variety of other things, the Urban Planner? How did Toll Brothers decide to uh, take a lock on opening up an office in New York City with you? Well. They found me through an ad, a classified ad in the New York Times that I responded to. Um, I was at Silver Cup for four years and starting to look for, you know, new opportunities. Um, really, really great guys to work for. Uh, learned a lot. Um, but uh, Toll had uh, started a, an urban group uh, in New Jersey, in Hoboken, by buying a small company called Manhattan Builders. And then... Um, uh, taking over the properties that they were developing, some very big ones, Maxwell Place and Hudson T. So they were doing that for about a year, and then Bob Toll, who and has a place in Manhattan, and his brother Bruce also, uh, I guess said to himself, why don't we just come right across the river? We got New York City right here. So rather than uh, buying a company, they decided to hire an individual, and so it was me. And you know, So you were the first employee? I was the first employee, yeah. They, they hired me. They... Um, you know, they gave me a cell phone and a laptop and said, uh, go look find, for some land. Go look for some land. And I, the first thing I said was, I'm going to need an office. And they said, um, well, we thought you might uh, work out of your home. And at that time, I was living in a loft, but it was a one bedroom loft with uh, three kids. So I'm not going to work out of my home. So I got some temporary uh, shared office space on Livingston Street in Brooklyn Heights. So how many developments have you done since uh, Toll Brothers opened up totally? Uh, we're on, in New York City, I would say about our 15th building. So that's over 10, 11 years. So it's it's pretty good amount of work. Uh, one advantage is that um, we're very well capitalized. So during the downturn, we were able to... Um, to buy sites when other right. condo guys so, could. So you were in Brooklyn, you're in Brooklyn now, you were in Long Island City, uh, and you have a number of developments today in Manhattan. Most are in Manhattan, yes. Okay, let's, let's talk about family. Your wife, her yes. name? Uh, Anna uh, Quintana. And how many children do you have? We have three children. Stella's the oldest, and she goes to Brooklyn Prospect Charter School. And then we have uh, twins, also girls, Allie and Lily, who are 12, and they're at MS-51 uh, in Park Slope, where so, Dante de Blasio went to school. So for the kid whose family grew up in the Bay Ridge section, who spent an inordinate amount of time in Brooklyn, who's back in Brooklyn, who's been very involved with the Brooklyn Roundtable and the other group over there, uh, it's truly been an uh, interesting ride, and I'm happy that you were my guest today. Thank you.